Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you like, you can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash CanadaEHX. You can also donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking Donate. Don't forget, I have three other podcasts out there. From John to Justin, which releases every single Friday. I have Canada's Great War, which releases every single Sunday. And I have Coast to Coast, which releases every single Thursday. All are available on all podcast platforms. As well, I do all of these full-time. The writing, the research, everything. So, every dollar you give helps keep it all going. And if you do donate, I'll make sure I give you a shout-out directly on the air and throughout my social media. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram at Bairdo37. And if you enjoy the episode, please consider giving a five-star review. If you leave a review, I'll mention it on the air, and I'll thank you throughout my social media. Long before any Europeans ever set foot in Canada, the area that would be Estevan was home to several different indigenous nations and cultures, many long forgotten to time. By the time Europeans started to move into the area, the indigenous groups were the Blackfoot, the Assiniboine, and the Sioux people. The bison were an important part of their culture, with huge herds migrating through the region. The region also provided ample game, places to gather food, and rest. As such, it was a frequent stopping point until Europeans migrated in and disrupted this practice that had been going on for millennia. As with many places in the Canadian prairies, the birth of Estevan comes because of the arrival of the Canadian Pacific Railway. The original main line did not go through the community when it passed through the area in the 1880s, but in 1892, a branch line was created which led to the establishment of Estevan. The name comes from George Stevens' registered telegraph address of Estevan, and Stephen was the first president of the Canadian Pacific Railway from 1881 to 1888. This is not to say that the railroad was the only reason for settlement. Coal was discovered in the area, and the first viable coal mine near Estevan was established in 1891. For the next several years, small coal mines would operate in the area as Estevan began to grow. With the expansion of the main line of the railroad into the area, this led to many American settlers coming up to work homesteads. Estevan became a major point along the northwest-southeast trade route, and thanks to this fortunate placing, by 1899, Estevan was incorporated as a village. In 1906 became a town as its population swelled to 600, and in 1957 the community became a city, and today is the 8th largest city in Saskatchewan with a population of 11,000 people. Coal mining was a major industry for the area, along with agriculture, and many farmers combined the two to have a coal mining income that sustained their farms during hard years. These small coal mines thrived for decades until the 1930s, when the Great Depression collapsed both the coal and the farm markets. By 1956, underground coal mining had come to an end in the area, but one large coal mine still operates in the area of Estevan to this day digging 8 million tons of coal every single year. New residents to the area also discovered something other than coal when they arrived in the area. They found that it was sunny, very sunny. In fact, Estevan gets more sunshine per year than any other city in Canada, 2,499.9 hours. As a result, the community has been called the sunshine capital of Canada. In contrast, Prince Rupert in British Columbia only has 250 hours of sunshine per year. In 1911, a small inn was built on 1.2 hectares of land along Long Creek just south of Estevan. This three-story wood frame house was originally on a homestead and became one of the most recognizable buildings in the entire community. And after he retired in 1929, the home was briefly owned by the Stavely family. From the 1930s to the 1980s, the home was owned by James W. Dolphy. So, why do I bring up this house? There are many houses in Estevan, after all. Well, one of the relatives of Adolphi was a man by the name of W. O. Mitchell, who was one of Canada's greatest authors, 
and Mitchell frequently visited the house in the 1930s and likely did some writing there. The house would eventually be moved in 1992 and now serves as a bed and breakfast, so you can sleep in a house that was once a favorite place for an iconic Canadian author to visit. When the First World War broke out, many from Estefan enlisted to fight overseas. Many did not return. In 1915, so many people from Estevan wanted to serve in France that a special battalion was created to accommodate them. The 152nd Battalion, made up entirely of Estevan and Weyburn residents, was authorized on December 22, 1915. The Empire Hotel in Estevan actually served as the recruiting location and the third floor was rented out as a barracks for the battalion. The battalion would sail for England on October 3, 1916. There, the members absorbed into the 32nd Reserve Battalion on October 21st. The battalion would serve until it was disbanded on May 21, 1917. The battalion was commanded by Lieutenant Colonel S.B. Nels, and while in France, the battalion would take part in several battles, including the Battle of Hill 70. Those soldiers who gave their lives and fought overseas have been honoured in Estevan with the Soldier's Tree, carved by chainsaw sculpture artist Darren Jones. Carved from a 100-year-old cottonwood tree, it is located in a park in the centre of the community and features amazing artwork. The carving features several soldiers, including one soldier who is pulling another soldier to safety amid an explosion carved into the tree. The tree also features a Royal Canadian Navy sailor, a female Royal Canadian Air Force sergeant, and a Royal Canadian Air Force pilot in a Spitfire plane. At the bottom of the tree is a battlefield grave with poppies adorning it. There are also several soldiers' trees benches that feature soldiers on each of the armrests. And it's a stunning work of art that truly has to be seen to be believed, and no visit to Estevan is complete without it. During the First World War years, a daring robbery would occur on the highway near Estevan on August 13, 1917. It was on that day when Jack Bloomfield, John Yovanovitch, and Johnny Brown began a robbering spree that set the entire area on edge. The target of this robbery spree was a man named Percy Manning, who had skipped from the gang with his girlfriend Louise Connors for Winnipeg after obtaining money from the other men. The three men began to follow Manning and Connors until they reached them in Estevan where they went into the hotel and robbed Connors of her gold watch, chain, money and a revolver and cut to pieces a suit of clothes owned by Manning. They then left in a car driven by Carl Burnt, with Manning following close behind on foot. The gang then decided to turn around towards Manning and beat him up. They took $3,600 off of him and robbed him of all of his clothes except for one sock and one shoe. They then left for Moose Jaw. A person driving by in a car found Manning and believed him to be insane and did not believe his story at first. He agreed to take Manning back to Estevan wrapped only in a small rug. As for the four men, they were soon arrested in Moose Jaw, but the money, amounting to a significant $63,000 today, was never recovered. I've already mentioned that coal and farming were big industries in the early years of Estevan, but there was another big industry that had a heyday of only a couple of years. Beginning in 1920, as America started to ramp up its Prohibition era, Estevan discovered a brand new industry for itself, bootlegging. Throughout the Canadian prairies, boozeroriums started to pop up. Essentially, these were warehouses filled with alcohol, and Estevan, due to its proximity to the United States border, had two of them. At the time, there was no laws in Saskatchewan that prevented the exportation of liquor to the United States. As a result, people could come up from the United States, buy all the alcohol they wanted and not worry about being arrested until they reached the border. Once they reached the border, they need to get back into America without being caught by law enforcement or even other alcohol traders who were looking to rob them and make a quick buck. This profitable era for Estevan would last only two years until American pressure led to changes in Saskatchewan laws. I'd like to take a break away from the episode for a second, to talk about ExploreNet. I spent most of my life living in rural areas in Canada, and I remember the days of dial-up internet and spotty high-speed service. For the past three years, I have been a customer of ExploreNet, and I can honestly say that it is the best rural internet I have ever had. My job as a podcaster means I spend a lot of time researching online, interviewing people over Zoom, and uploading content. Through it all, ExploreNet has provided me with excellent service. 
When I'm not working, I enjoy streaming content on several streaming platforms and even doing some online gaming with a friend in Ontario. ExploreNet allows me to do all of that with ease. Right now, they offer up to 50 megabits per second on their new LTE network with unlimited data. Their service has only become faster and better since I first signed on. Today and beyond, ExploreNet is investing in building and upgrading the network at a rapid pace. ExploreNet is rural, and that is their route, and that is their focus. For more information about rural internet options in your area, go to ExploreNet.com or call 1-866-285-2253. A few years after the Prohibition era ended in Estevan, a very unique creature would be found nearby, buried for millions of years in the ground. In November of 1926, and I hope I pronounce this correctly, an Ichthyosauri was found in the district measuring at about 50 feet long. The fossil had been found by Reverend C. Harrington, who lived in the area after he developed an interest in some of the smaller fossils found in the region. He invited a Professor Thompson, who was a geologist with the University of London, to come out, and together they found this amazing fossil. In the region, the fossil became known as the Lizard, and for a time it was the biggest news of the entire area. As for what the creature was, it first appeared about 250 million years ago, and at least one species survived until 90 million years ago. A water-based dinosaur, it was similar to dolphins as it evolved in water, went to land, and then returned to water during its evolution. They also had a layer of blubber for insulation, and large bladed teeth to kill large animals. One of the most significant events in the history of Estevan would occur on September 29, 1931, on a day now referred to as Black Tuesday. Beginning on September 7th, local miners went on strike for better wages and working conditions. In a later commission on the riot, one woman would state that families lived in one bedroom, two beds in there, with a dining room, a kitchen, with a bed in there, and 11 people in all sharing a home. Rain would come into the homes, and in the morning and the winter, snow would be on the floor. The strikers wanted the mining company to improve the homes and end the company's store monopoly as well. With the strike beginning on September 7th, Annie Buller, working with the Workers' Unity League, spoke in Estevan in support of the strikers. Buller was a well-known union organizer and also the co-founder of the Communist Party of Canada. On September 29th, miners began to parade through the city and were confronted by the RCMP, who blocked the parade. Violence broke out, and the RCMP fired on the strikers, killing three and injuring several others. The next morning, 90 RCMP officers raided the homes of the miners and arrested 13, including Annie Buller, who was sentenced to one year of hard labor. The RCMP involved in the killing of the miners were never charged, but a total of 20 miners were charged with various offenses. On October 6, after meeting with the Royal Commission Council, the strike ended, with the company agreeing to a $4 minimum wage, an 8-hour working day, reduced rent, and an end to the company's store monopoly. Today, the event is still controversial in Estevan. The three headstones for the miners still have Murdered by the RCMP inscribed on them, which is sometimes erased and then restored by locals. The courthouse that stands in the community to this day was the location of the deadly strike action by the RCMP. It was also where the Royal Commission would investigate the incident, chaired by Estevan Judge E.R. Wiley. The structure had been built only two years previous and was designed by architect Maurice Sharon, the provincial designer from 1916 to 1930. He had designed ten provincial courthouses and Estevan was his last one. Today, the courthouse is now a provincial heritage property for its role in the community and its role in the strike. In 1980, Estevan would be the site of a contentious by-election. By-elections tend not to be too interesting, but this one truly was, and it involved a future Premier of Saskatchewan. Grant Devine had lost in the 1978 election, but he was chosen as the leader of the provincial Progressive Conservative Party in 1979 nonetheless. When Robert Larder resigned due to health reasons from the Legislative Assembly, this opened up the riding, and Devine looked to get elected there. The by-election would feature Devine, Jack Chapman, and Ralph Goodale. People in Estevan found themselves bombarded with phone calls, door knockers, and out-of-town MLAs descending on the community to promote their candidate. Many residents were also angry that Devine had parachuted into the riding in an attempt to get elected. The election featured several attacks against Pierre Elliott Trudeau, the Liberal Prime Minister, 
and McLean's would write a week after the by-election, quote, The two-ton flatbed truck that came rattling down 4th Street, as to Van's main drag, provided the action highlight of provincial by-election. Perched precariously on the back was a dilapidated privy crudely scrawled with such fiery messages as Trudeau and Blakeney, the Brotherhood and Western Federation. The seat of the two-holer had been removed and mounted up front, labeled reserved for Trudeau. Estevan police, alerted by telephone call, swept into action to impound the privy and determine whether it also constituted a breach of election acts ban on voting day campaigning. End quote. In the end, Devine would fail to win the by-election, losing by 97 votes to Jack Chapman. Devine would note that Chapman won with only 37% of the popular vote, and that he and Goodale had 63%. He also blamed the NDP for lower voter turnout. The election was so close that there was a chance at a recount, since 16 votes were spoiled at least. In the end, the recount found that Chapman won by only 60 votes. Everyone involved in the election would have good careers afterwards, though, Chapman would represent the area until 1982, while Goodale would serve in the legislature from 1986 to 1988, and then in Parliament from 1993 to 2019. He is currently Canada's High Commissioner to the United Kingdom. As for Devine, he would finally get elected in 1982 and became Premier of the province, serving until 1991. On July 11, 1982, the community would be visited by a very special person when Princess Anne, daughter to Queen Elizabeth II, arrived in Estevan. After visiting several other communities, she would have lunch with 200 community leaders in the community and was presented with two furry dolls for her two children. She would visit the Royal Canadian Legion Hall as people called out her name outside the building. She would also visit the utility coal site at the Boundary Dam power station and inspect the earth-moving drag lines. In all, she spent a few hours in the community before moving on with the rest of her tour. If you'd like to learn more about the history of Estevan, you can visit not one, but two museums. The first is the Estevan Art Gallery Museum. Now this facility is mostly an art gallery, but it does feature historical collections from the community including the Northwest Mounted Police Wood and Post Historical Site. The building was constructed in 1893 and used by the Northwest Mounted Police when they first arrived in the area. By 1892, there was one staff sergeant, two corporals, and 15 constables stationed at the building. This led to the construction of a much larger building, and that building was abandoned in 1897 and would be used as a home for several families in the area. The building would finally be bought and moved to the art gallery property where it stored artifacts and in 1994 it became part of the museum in its own right. You can also visit the Surus Valley Museum, which is a 5,000 square foot facility that houses several themed exhibits that highlight the history of Estevan and the surrounding area. Indoor exhibits include a post office, bank, general store, pioneer home, and a display to honor the indigenous people of the area. Outdoor exhibits include an original schoolhouse, a Harvest Cook rail car, a homestead, and a heritage mining display. I hope you enjoyed that episode and my look at the community of Estevan. And if you did, please leave a rating and review. If you like, you can reach me through email at craig at canadaehx.com. You can also visit my website where you'll find hundreds of articles on Canada's history as well as all my podcast episodes. Just go to canadaehx.com. And don't forget you can support the podcast through Patreon. There are multiple tiers to choose from, all with great benefits. You can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month, just like all of these wonderful patrons have, and I apologize if I mispronounce any names. Lionel Romaine, Randy Hayden, Doug Campbell, Reg W., Deborah Carlson, Francis Helbling, Randall McCallum, Diane Wade, Laurieann Kirby, Nick Zinri, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Chauve, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Rawa, Luke S., J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, and Iris Gray. If you want, you can find me on Facebook. Just go to facebook.com slash CanadianHistoryX. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-E-A-I-R-D. And you can find me on Instagram. Just go to Bairdo37. Thanks. We'll see you again next time.